Today's episode was executive produced by AC. Thank you, AC. If you'd like to join AC in helping us to survive by becoming an executive producer, just go to peterbernard.com. Welcome, 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 welcome to Scary Story. The channel that tells you scary stories. Welcome to Scary Stories NYC. I'm your old pal, Bigfoot. We've got an interesting mix of stories today. First, we have a new story from the fellow who says we can call him Ralph. He's the one whose family claims cohabitation with Dogman since the 1800s. His story today is about the first time he saw a Dogman when he was still just a kid. We also have a new story from Daquan Weaver, who was executive producer of yesterday's show. Daquan says this actually happened to him, and it might be controversial with some of you, not because it says anything bad about Dogman, but because it says something good about him. Is Dogman evil, as some people say? Is it an enemy of humanity? Or... Can an encounter with a dogman ever be beneficial? These controversial issues are dealt with head on in the new story from Daquan Weaver later in this show. We also have a collection of material today about the dogman legends of Werewolf Springs in Tennessee. This area has a history about dogman that literally goes back to the 1860s and allegedly continues into modern times, at least according to some. This story is a special request from Bobby Jean in our audience. Thanks for the good idea, Bobby Jean. We have a story alleged to have taken place recently about a quarter of an hour's drive away from Werewolf Springs, so stay tuned for that as well. There's lots more scary dogman encounter tales even after that on the show, so I hope you're in the mood for Upright Walking Canids. Let's get started with our daily update on Dogman, Dogman Daily, as told in the words of our gracious whistleblower, Ralph. Greetings and felicitations, Scary Stories viewers. I'm here with another story about Dogman and my family. This, in fact, is the story of the first dogman I ever saw with my own eyes. You can call me Ralph, and you can call my segment Dogman Daily. If you've watched our previews, you already know that Dogman Daily is an in-joke in our family. We see Dogman so frequently that when it happens, we shout that the new edition of the Dogman Daily is out and on the stands used to make more sense in the 20th century when everybody bought newspapers at newsstands every single day, sometimes several times a day. The way things are now, I guess it's just an in-joke, but you're in on the joke, so welcome. Today, I would like to tell the story of the first time I joined together in my mind the stories of the dogman I'd been told since I was born with an actual, physical, outside-of-my-imagination type being. This was the first time I realized that sometimes legends exist outside of stories and in real life. And in turn, that's how real life can sometimes become stories and legends. At least, if you survive to tell others what happened to you. My family and I have a pretty wondrous house. These days... We have all the latest tech gadgets from South Korea and Japan, but this was a fascinating place to be long before even radio and television took hold. We have a library holding answers to secrets few other collections of data can respond to. We have secret and hidden passageways behind false walls and trap doors. We have more to discover in this house and the adjoining land than I will ever discover even if I live to be 150 years old. That having been said, this is also a dangerous place to live. 
My father's second wife once calculated the odds of survival here and compared it with urban neighborhoods across the country. We came out comparable to neighborhoods in Chicago and New York City. The way we were all raised, up to and including me, was to be wary of this land and to expect the unexpected, to respect the wildness of where we lived and to know we could pay the ultimate price if the property itself felt disrespected. We were taught to view the dog man as just one face, one guise that the land itself could take in order to mete out punishment if its rules were not strictly adhered to. After me, my younger half-sister and brother were raised in dad's second wife's way, with no continuation of, or respect for, family tradition whatsoever. But, this is not a story about them. This is a story dating back to before they were born, when my mother was still alive. This is a story about me and the dog man. I had a friend back in school, let's call him Arnold. I had stayed over his house twice, and he asked why I never invited him to come stay at our old mansion. I guess I just never thought it made sense to expose people to the danger inherent in visiting a place where a dog man was allowed to roam free. I also knew that a lot of what we had in our collections was off limits to outsiders, but I could never remember which was which. It was easier for me to go visit my friends than to confer for an hour with my parents about what parts of the house my friend was allowed to see. But eventually, Arnold's mom ran into mine at the supermarket and soon he was officially invited over for a sleepover. My parents set us up in our own wing of the house, on the ground floor, around on the side by the forest, the part of the house that nobody ever went to, in other words. Their excuse was that my room was too small for two boys, which wasn't really true. I suspect the real reason was to keep Arnold out of trouble by banishing us to the furthest corner of the entire structure. I remember waking up in the middle of the night and hearing a tapping at the window. I got up and looked outside and saw nobody there. I thought I had dreamed the tapping, but then I noticed that Arnold was missing from the room. I walked out in the hallway to the bathroom to see if he had gone there, and I saw that it was dark. I listened, and I couldn't hear any activity at all in that wing of the house. Confused as to where my friend had gone, I walked back into the room we had been assigned, and there... At the window I had just checked a minute or two earlier, was standing a terrifying-looking man-like beast. I did not at first connect him with the dog man. I just saw a tall silhouette lit slightly from the front by dim incidental lighting inside my room, but mainly lit from behind by the outside yard lights marking the edge of the forest. This was a wild-looking thing, even before you could make out details on it. It wasn't like something that posed majestically and moved slowly as I had imagined the monster dogman of the forest to be. It was, in that sense, like any other beast of the forest or jungle that you might come dangerously close to. His movements were swift and unpredictable. It could sometimes seem illogical and almost silly, then a second later flash intelligence in its eyes and seem as though its thoughts were a million miles ahead of mine. It reminded me of the king of the jungle in one sense, and yet also reminded me of a low-class hustling criminal on the other. This was something built to survive in the wild with no help from anybody. This was not something created to exist in civilization. Here was the ultimate loner and the absolute individualist. And yet, I could sense that his internal life was no less complex than my own. Its glowing eyes conveyed intensity, 
but also what I would have previously referred to as humanity. It was easy to get lost in its eyes, and it was tempting to do so. But when I did, I could see its dog-like or wolf-like face, and I put the pieces together that this was, in fact, a real-time manifestation of that legendary monster, the Dog Man, that I had been warned about since before I could read and write. One of the main warnings attached to the Dogman tales told in my family was that their eyes could sometimes be hypnotic in the way vampires are in some stories. I tore my eyes away, and that thing? It tapped on the window to try to get my attention again. It sounded like dog claws on the glass and it was the same sound I had heard that woke me up in the first place. So I knew I hadn't imagined that part. I backed out of the bedroom and began what to me at that stage of my development was a thorough search of all bedrooms on that floor, at least in that wing. I was looking for Arnold, and I was not finding him. Eventually... I found my way up to my actual bedroom and fell asleep in my real bed. I had a nightmare that Arnold was buried alive, and I woke up in a panic, drenched in sweat. I heard him screaming, and I wondered if it was in my own imagination or maybe out in the old family cemetery. I looked out the window in the direction of the graveyard, but it didn't look as though anyone were down there. I was still groggy and half asleep, but I ran out of my bedroom thinking the screaming was coming from downstairs. As I ran toward my parents' bedroom, however, it became louder, and as I ran past it, the screaming became quieter. I stopped running, realizing that Arnold must be in my parents' room. Looking inside, I saw both of them out of bed, Pulling things out from underneath, I was completely baffled as to what the meaning of this behavior was intended to be. But I stayed outside, peering in. In case they were trapping kids and burying them alive, I wanted to stay out of their line of vision just for the moment. Eventually, my father rolled this big wooden box out from under the bed that they would keep extra bedspreads and blankets in. And as soon as it came out from under there, the cover of that box popped open and Arnold sat up. My mother screamed, as though she hadn't just been hearing this kid shout for the last five or ten minutes. Arnold got up and ran around the house shouting like a chicken with its head cut off. My father drove him home, but wouldn't tell me anything the kid had said on the way there. When I tried to call his house the next day, both he and his parents hung up on me. When I next ran into him at school, I asked him what happened that night, and he told me I already knew, and I should be the one explaining things to him. He was convinced I had played some kind of trick on him, possibly with the help of my parents, and that we were all sick in the head. He never really explained to me what happened. Did he fall asleep in bed and wake up in the box? Did anything happen in between? If so, what? I still wish he would explain it to me even all these years afterward. So, my first experience with the Dogman was scary and alarming and creepy all on its own. The fact that it was coupled with this other impossible thing happening to my now former friend, this seeming teleportation event, or maybe poltergeist occurrence, only made it kick through the wall like the Kool-Aid man and say, oh yeah, in my permanent memory even more than it already would have. I don't understand how the dog man and the other event involving Arnold were related. And I don't know if the dog man was directly responsible for what happened to that kid that night. But I do know that if the dog man is around, then absolutely anything else becomes possible too. Maybe it's because the universe thinks that once you have one impossible thing happening, you've already sort of jumped the shark. 
You may as well not make any sense at all any longer. That might sound like a joke and maybe it is, but that's the closest I can get to explaining my current working hypothesis about the strange side of life. I mean, why do so many of us feel an underlying connection between all these apparently completely separate phenomena, since the phenomena themselves all seem so deeply rooted in our feelings and inner fears, the gut feelings about their interconnectedness would seem to carry more weight than they might in the usual existential argument. Short version of all this, my first encounter with Dogman went in a direction I had never been warned it might go. It was terrifying, but in ways I never knew existed, and it asked questions I no longer expect to get answers to in this lifetime. It was a monster, but it was a kind of monster that didn't only threaten my life in a physical sense. It threatened my very grasp on, or ability to have a grasp on, reality itself. It changed everything so that I couldn't ever really be as sure of anything as I had been before. I now can understand how little we know, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I learned of my own absolute ignorance from the Dogman. I'll be back tomorrow with a story set back in the early 20th century about a girl, a dogman, and a long railroad track. We're going to have a special longer episode on the 30th. That's right, Nancy. That's the night before Halloween. And to celebrate, we're putting on the, the night, night before, before Halloween, Halloween special. special. And we'll all have our own extra scary stories we've been saving up for that scariest of holidays. Wednesday, October 30th. We'll all be there. Hope you are too. It's the night before Halloween special. An extra long dogman scary stories extravaganza right here on the Scary Stories NYC channel. A while back, we told you a story that we received from one of our viewers, Daquan Weaver. In fact, Daquan was the executive producer of yesterday's episode. In his original story, he told us about a white-eyed dogman in his neighborhood, witnessed by both him and his sister. This new story is about a second sighting of either the same or a very similar-looking creature. Only this time... Daquan was left with a very different feeling about what happened. Let's dive right into the story which we call The Return of the White-Eyed Dogman or The Divine Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, about two weeks after the encounter my sister and I had with the White-Eyed Dogman, I had a very similar and yet, very different experience. It was dark, around midnight, and I was walking down West Main Street by the Laurelwood Cemetery in Rock Hill, South Carolina. As I was walking down the block, I noticed that somebody was following me down the same sidewalk. I mean, another person, not Dogman. I didn't make a big deal out of it at first, but... After a couple of minutes, I looked back and saw that this person was now just a couple of feet behind me. I really started to worry because, of course, I knew this was not normal behavior. This guy should not be walking as close to me as he was, especially not at midnight. After this realization dawned on me, I felt something jab against my back and I gasped instinctively, stopped walking, and froze up, waiting to hear what was going to happen next. He told me to empty my pockets and made it clear that something really bad was going to happen if I didn't. As I pulled things out and handed them over, I noticed a tall figure standing in the tree line about 20 feet ahead of me. I noticed the silhouette of the figure was large, but then I noticed that white eye shine. No human has white eye shine. The only thing that looks like that is the dog man. So now I had one thing going on behind me and another thing in front. And I wasn't sure which was scarier as they were both situations that might turn out to be the end of my story. I was shaking in fear. But when I continued staring at those eyes in front of me, 
those inhuman monster eyes. I didn't feel any hostility coming toward me. I felt like I was safe in the presence of this being, and that my only problem in that moment was the member of my own human species threatening everything behind me. After looking into those eyes, I heard a voice in my head say, Move forward, and I will take care of him. I began to walk forward, but the only way I was taken care of in that moment was that I remember seeing stars, and I remember the sidewalk rushing up to say hello to my face. I also remember a deep growling and a whole lot of shouting, but there was nothing I could do about it. The darkness around the edges of my vision took over, and that's the last I remember of that situation. I think I was out cold for a couple minutes because I came to, looking up at the sky, surrounded by what you might call concerned citizens, and in that swirling, confusing sea of faces, I was certain I saw my cousin? This is a cousin I haven't seen for years. His gaze was warm, and it looked like his eyes were shining. On the other hand, that could have been my concussion or something else like that that caused me to think that about his eyes. As I was lifted onto a hospital stretcher and loaded into the ambulance, his eyes had a knowing look in them, and I was confused. This was a cousin I had a special relationship with in a sense, but on the other hand... It made no sense at all for him to even be there. I guess I still am confused about that because after that night, I've never seen him again. I guess you can say I was lucky to not end up being a midnight snack to the being I saw in the trees that night, but I believe that was him, my cousin. Remember when you joked on your show about the dog man being my cousin? Well... I believe he listened to that story entitled White-Eyed Werewolf, and he must have appreciated that I called him an intelligent beast. Now, I'm not saying that every dogman is one of God's angels, but I believe that was a divine intervention, and so I want to call this story The Divine Dogman. We'll be right back with an all-new scary dogman story called The Werewolf of Werewolf Springs, Tennessee. Come see those American girls perform semi-live in hologram form on stage at the next Northeast Comic Con. Meet Batman villains from the Gotham TV show. Watch Will Briarly's artificially intelligent cartoon character interview celebrities. See Debbie, Sophie, Alicia, and Chibi perform on stage. All this plus so much more. Breaking news just added to the show are these stars. Dana DiLorenzo, star of Ash vs. the Evil Dead, the greatest horror comedy series that will ever be shake the hand that ended the second lives of so many deadites also marty ross of the new monkeys denny lane from wings and the moody blues co-writer of mull of kintyre he will actually come hang out with us mortals Hosted by the king of pop culture himself, Gary Summers. That's the last weekend of November 2019 in Boxborough, Massachusetts, home of the wolf people. Yesterday, Bobby Jean in our comments section asked me to check out the histories online of Werewolf Springs, a legendary location in Tennessee. I was fascinated by the stories about this area and... I do have a Dogman story that took place about a 14-15 minute drive from Werewolf Springs itself. I'll tell you that never before heard story after I recount the Dogman related history of this location, which goes back far longer than most American werewolf legends. According to the versions of the legends I've been able to find online, back in the 1860s, a train running nearby derailed and a lot of animals and exhibits from a traveling circus escaped into those woods. Supposedly, everyone and everything was found after an extensive search except for one act, the Wolfmen of Borneo. 
Now, I did some searching, and it turns out in real life there actually was a circus act called the Wild Men of Borneo back in the late 1800s, but they were not werewolves or dogmen at all. Some of you might think that there are no surviving historical records of the Wolfmen of Borneo because, duh, they escaped into the woods around Dixon, Tennessee. Others of you might assume that this is all just a legend and that there never really was an act called the Wolfmen of Borneo, either in Tennessee or anywhere else. But in this legend, that's where the story starts. Two years after the alleged derailment, Again, according to legend, a man and his servant were traveling by horse-drawn wagon through an area near Hall Springs. Basically, what it seems to be is a few large puddles or small lakes, some muddier and some more clear, and they are all created from water bubbling up from deeper in the earth. For whatever reason, at least on that particular mid-1800s evening, the springs were being guarded by a large, hairy, monstrous thing. It pursued their wagon and they couldn't get away from it. Panicking, both men jumped off and each ran in an opposite direction from the other. The monster pursued the hired hand and the employer escaped to report the incident. Although the monster was called a wolf man or a werewolf, the descriptions sound as though it might have been something more like a Sasquatch. In any case, the local name for those springs became Werewolf Springs, which it is still referred to as even into the 21st century. You won't find the name on maps, though, as its official name is now Hall Springs. You can visit it in person if you go to Montgomery Wells State Park, located about a 15-minute drive from Dixon. Be prepared to work to get there, though, as it's at the end of a long overnight hike. But if you can manage to go through all that and reach the location, you will know that you are standing on the very same muddy land where some of the oldest American dogman, or possibly Sasquatch, sightings were ever reported. I personally don't know if there ever was a train derailment that released strange species into that location. There are still old railroad tracks that run along in the place they are supposed to according to the legend though, so maybe it did happen. Maybe it's a conflation of a few different stories turned into a heck of an entertaining campfire narrative. Maybe there really was a train derailment or even more than one. And maybe there are strange cryptids seen and heard in the area, but what if the one has nothing to do with the other? The werewolf of the springs is not the only strange thing reported around there. You've also got, for instance, the white screamer. There is debate as to whether the screamer is a cryptid, a known animal, a spirit, a ghost, or a banshee. If you listen to all the stories, it seems like a bit of each, but fits none of the legends completely. All we do know for sure about the white screamer is that it's heard screaming in the night like a woman. There are stories of foxes doing this. There are stories of Sasquatch doing this, mountain lions, and supernatural legendary creatures as well. Whatever it is, the white screamer is as reported in the area as the alleged Borneo werewolf itself. You can also find ghost stories from that locality, so Dixon is no one-trick paranormal or cryptid pony. It's got a diverse combination of histories and legends that continue to this day. About five months ago, I got this short story alleged to have taken place a 15-minute drive from Werewolf Springs, and it's a report of seeing a dog-headed hairy humanoid. It does not take place in the woods, and the person that emailed me about it was not at the end of an overnight hike. He and his girlfriend literally claim they saw this upright walking canine in the parking lot in the back of Walmart. Before you laugh the story off, though, listen to the details, because it's pretty creepy, 
And if you look at the location on Google Maps, at least their story seems to make sense in terms of layout. The area they claim the dogman fled toward is an area with thicker cover of forest and less human habitation. When you add all this to the history of the area's mythology, I think the story becomes doubly or triply interesting. Not necessarily true, obviously, but interesting. So without any more explanation, let's jump to that story right now, which we are calling The Walmart Werewolf. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a dogman story that happened to me and my girlfriend behind the Walmart parking lot in Dixon, Tennessee. We had parked around the side of the store itself one time because that was where we found a spot closest to the entrance. By the time we were leaving the store carrying all our stuff in bags, it was pretty much night already. Both of us at the same moment heard and saw something rummaging in the garbage bin, or one of them. I thought it was a rat, or a bunch of them, so I instantly got nervous. I was wishing we had brought a cart out to our car. For some reason that night we had opted to carry our bags in our arms from the store to our car. I hurried my step, wanting to get the stuff in the trunk and get out of there before any large rodents started scurrying in our direction. As my girlfriend got the trunk open, I looked over toward the bin, and I saw two bright, reddish, orangish eyes shining back at me in the night. I shuddered all over and got that fight-or-flight adrenaline rush. Then, after that, I noticed that we had a much bigger problem than I had anticipated. We did not have a rat problem at all. We had... A dog man problem. I stupidly said to my girlfriend, don't look at the garbage bin. I was thinking it would be too scary for her and she would be unable to drive us out of there if she panicked. Of course, once I said it, she immediately looked toward the garbage bin. I mean, who wouldn't? It was a natural reaction. So was her screaming. I never heard her scream so loud. It hurt my ears. Maybe it hurt the dog man's ears as well because he gave her a look like she was the siren on a police car, and he ran out of there. I don't know what came over me, but when I saw him run, I threw my bags in that trunk, and I ran after him. I had been petrified of him one second earlier, but somehow, the way it ran away activated some primeval aspect of me from the ancient past, and I had to pursue that fleeing creature. I saw it run clear out of the parking lot and into a patch of trees heading toward Cowan Road. I believe that's some people's backyards over there that it must have run through, but there is more forest land beyond that. I was assuming it was a wild animal, so it must be returning there where it normally lived. If this was indeed a dogman, then we may have witnessed it scavenging. It would prove that the creature doesn't only hunt for its food. On the other hand, it might have been in the bin to hunt small prey that was itself scavenging off the garbage. Since I didn't investigate the interior of the garbage bin, nor did I follow the creature all the way back to its forest lair, I can't honestly say for certain in either case. Now that I've told you what happened, I want to go back and describe in more detail what we saw. I want to combine where my girlfriend and I agree about what we initially saw and what started her screaming her head off in fear. And then I want to add observations I made while running after it as it escaped back under the cover of the trees. First of all, this was not a bear with mange. I know that they are known to scavenge and that they are known to stand and even walk upright on their hind legs. However, this had an entirely different appearance and way of behaving than a bear, whether a sick or healthy one. It also was colored too lightly to be a bear as far as I know. The coloring was more like that of a wolf or maybe some kind of exotic dog than it was like a bear. 
I can't remember specifics, but it was not uniformly colored and had darker and lighter spots or possibly stripes on it. Sort of like kinds of cats, I guess, but in shades of gray like you might see on some kinds of wolves. The eyes seemed bright red to me at first, then a kind of reddish orange each time they flashed in my direction after that. My wife called the color she saw in its eyes blood orange. It was tall, but not taller than a man could be. It was under seven feet for certain. It was taller than I am, and I'm a half inch over six feet when standing in my socks. Initially, when I realized it was not a rat, of course, it seemed giant to me. I thought it was a giant rat, in fact, until I glimpsed enough of the snout to see it was far more canine in appearance than rodent. I think you can understand why, in the dark and in the context of fishing through garbage, I might have first perceived this long-snouted hairy thing as a giant rat, but it was definitely a dog-headed bipedal creature. My wife called it a dog standing up, but she had assumed it was a normal four-legged dog, even if a large and particularly frightening-looking one. She thought he was just leaning on the side of the bin. When we both saw it bolt out of that bin and run away on its hind legs, we were both more than a little stunned. My girlfriend reacted intelligently. She closed the car trunk and got in the driver's seat, then started the engine up. She looked to see where I had gone, and saw me running after the dog man. Which of us do you think is the smarter one? Easy question, right? So, what I saw when running after the thing was the most athletic creature on this planet, like almost a superhero of an animal. It ran on top of things, jumping gracefully and with lightning quickness from trash bin to car roof to fence to ground. It didn't just move fast. He moved nearly silently, and it was a thing to see. The creature possessed a long, thick, almost fox-like tail, with shades of gray mixing with warmer colors, then turning white at the pointed tip. I was glad it was running away, because I don't know what I could have done to defend myself if it decided to turn around and run toward me. And those are all the details I can remember about the Walmart werewolf. We'll be right back with the best of Dogman right after this Halloween movie binge. Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a story for you that took place around three years ago in October. I remember it was before Halloween, but not Halloween yet. Some of my friends and I, all total nerds, had found a weekend where we could reunite in my father's cabin and have a weekend-long werewolf marathon. We all used to watch movies and play D&D all weekend during the school holidays when we were kids. We grew up together. It's really hard to see each other as adults, in fact, we haven't been able to manage another reunion like this yet since. I do hope we once again do it, but next time, we should probably have it on the top floor of a high-rise building, far away from the forest, and far away from Dogman. So, we were all the kinds of nerds, or at least we were when we were younger, that we had elaborate and personal file systems so that we could instantly find television episodes and movies on our old tapes in a few seconds. We would label all our tapes and even indicate the time on the tape when the show started. I have all of my records in a cross-indexed spiral notebook. Two of the others used index cards, and the fourth of us was the first to computerize his list on his PC Jr. way back in the day. And we all kept records of each other's collections too. That's how I was able to curate this weekend marathon. I looked through all my records, 
made a list of all the werewolf movies we collectively had copies of, and then created a playlist in an order with start times that made sense to me. I presented the playlist via email to the others, and they each told me if the tapes in question were still extant and playable. We started renting VHS tapes back in the day when you could just hook two machines together and dub one tape off onto the other. So our collections were of movies and TV shows in second or third generation in the cheapest mode, the dreaded six-hour mode. Although most of the tapes look like crap when you run them, they look like the exact same crap they did back in the 80s. Most of the tape glitches came back then. Very few or none were from sitting in closets and on shelves for the last 30 years. I remember we all wondered back then how long these tapes would be playable. Well, I'll give you a spoiler. They all played well that weekend. Of course, we didn't get to play the entire program. Thanks to a little unasked for intermission. Courtesy of the dog man. My father's cabins are located near Black Creek in the woods of Mississippi. The closest town's a little place called Brooklyn of all things. Nothing like the Brooklyn in the movies, I assure you. It's close to the DeSoto National Forest and it's pretty wild. I mean, it's wild, but you're five minutes from a hamburger, so it's not that wild. Usually, anyway. So, When I first put the list of werewolf movies together, I got responses that some of my friends had bootleg or even legally purchased copies of more recent werewolf movies. We debated for a while whether those should be included. One of us suggested dubbing them onto VHS so that they would fit the theme, but the truth is that none of us even know how to dub anything off of a Blu-ray. We had a vote whether to include newer videos or keep it all open source VHS or what, and eventually we decided to try and run as many as we could. The final list was impressive. It included all the usual suspects like The Howling, Wolfen, The Howling 2, Wolfen 2, I'm just kidding, there's no Wolfen 2, but we did have The Howling 3, The Wolfman, The Howling 4, Werewolf of London, The Howling 5, Werewolf of Washington, The Howling 6, Werewolves on Wheels, The Howling 7, The Fury of the Wolfman starring Paul Nashi, but sadly, we did not have The Howling 8. I've still never seen that one. The first night went just as planned. We all met at the bus station and I drove us all out to the cabin. We had tons of microwave comfort foods and beverages nuking right away. We had a widescreen TV hooked into all sorts of older to newer video playing devices, including an old notebook computer with a disk drive to run our bootleg movies stored on DVD-Rs. In front of the screen were arranged futon mattresses, pillows of all shapes and sizes, and one comfy chair. Everybody had their shoes off, We were out in some wild nature, yet inside we were warm and overfed and really happy to be back doing our favorite thing with our favorite friends. We started the first movie, I Was a Teenage Werewolf, right on our scheduled time, and we ran films until we all crashed out. The next day, Saturday, everybody overslept, and we knew that the schedule of films was out the window before it even began. Three of us wanted something not microwaved for breakfast, so we all drove down to Brooklyn to get something good to eat. They didn't have breakfast, though, at least not by the time we got there, so it was burgers for lunch. We had so much fun hanging out at the restaurant, talking about old times, that by the time we got back to the cabin, it was already getting dark. My one friend, Manny wanted to start off the night of movies by telling us about something that the rest of us had never heard of before. The very first werewolf movie 
of all time. It's now considered lost, as in nobody knows where to find a copy of it. But there is a playbill advertising it which survives, and a plot synopsis. Appropriately enough, the film was called The Werewolf, and it was released December 13th, 1913. A silent black and white film running 18 minutes. You can look it up if you don't believe me. It did exist, but as far as we know, it doesn't exist any longer. The story in the film is unlike the story of any other werewolf movie I'd ever heard of. In fact, it isn't like any other film I can think of at all. It tells the tale of a Native American woman who thinks her husband has left her. Actually, he was done away with by the invading Europeans. She becomes a bruja, a witch, or a sorcerer. Then, she teaches her daughter the craft as well, and her daughter chooses to become a werewolf or skinwalker. She uses her powers as a werewolf to battle against the Europeans, but eventually they defeat her. Then, 100 years later, the she-wolf rises from the dead to take care of all the white people living on what was once her people's native land. We all sat there, awed by this retelling, imagining what it must have been like to have been able to see the film back in 1913. I was a bit more freaked out by the story than the others. My friend Manny asked me if I was okay. I tried to laugh, but that story had kind of scared me. I explained to them that the cabin we were in was supposed to have been located on what was once native soil. The others all made fun of me and laughed it up, saying all of the United States was once Native American soil, every square inch of it. Of course, they were right, but something about that story gave me the creeps. All that weekend up till then had felt like really comfortable, creature features kind of scary. That way of feeling scared of the movie, but really knowing that you are safe and comfortable and only imagining being scared. After that story, though, I couldn't get warm any longer, and I began to feel more and more as though I were the other kind of scared, the legitimately, actually, uncomfortably scared kind of scared. After they finished laughing at me, we started the entertainment off with The Curse of the Werewolf, starring the late, great Oliver Reed. I found myself distracted, and I kept thinking I was seeing a shadow run past the window on the side of the TV screen. I would look and see nothing, then assume it had been a reflection from the TV on the window. After it happened a fourth time in a row, I just stared at that window waiting for it to happen again. When I looked directly at it, though, all I could see was Oliver Reed reflected back at me in reverse, flopped left to right from the TV screen. There was another window on that side of the house, in the bathroom in the back. I quietly stole away from the others and went into that bathroom, closing the door behind me, and leaving the light off so I could see out better in the night. I stood in front of the window and looked out there, not sure exactly what I was hoping to see. It was a quiet night, a gust of breeze every so often, then stillness once again. The stars were out, and the moon as well. It was very Halloween-y, and the perfect night for werewolf movies. I felt silly for having scared myself, a fully grown adult behaving like a kid. Well, I guess that was the point of this weekend. I turned to go back to the others and I swear as I did, I thought I saw that shadow move outside again. I turned as quickly as I could and right in my face was a dog directly on the other side of the window. I couldn't tell how it had gotten there so fast. The nearest bush it could have been hiding behind was 20 feet away. 
Had it been under the window the entire time? Had it just sprung up to scare me? I ran out of that bathroom, screaming like my hair was on fire. I got up to the others and cursed them all out, asking who did that to me? Who just did that to me? They were confused and laughing, and their laughter made me more paranoid than ever that they had just played a trick on me. Who was that outside who had scared me? Was it a costume? They were playing it straight now, assuring me that they didn't do anything and they didn't know what I was talking about. They asked me to describe what I saw when there was a sound outside the window by the TV. Then we all screamed at the same time. That wolf or dog was there outside the window, standing on her hind legs and showing us clearly that she was a female. She barked like she was very unhappy with us. It went between growling and baring her teeth and this other, whinier sound that somehow seemed even more threatening. She did this weird dog thing where she looked at us sideways, but you could tell she looked as scared as she was trying to make us feel. Something about our very presence seemed somehow to threaten her. She ran away from the window and began circling the house, occasionally banging into it in a threatening manner. She wanted us to come out, but there was no way that was going to happen. My friend Geezer started putting his boots on. I asked him why he was doing that. He said, in case she huffed and puffed and blew our house in, he wanted to be ready to run for it. That started a discussion of making a run for the car, but... I said we should only do that if the she-wolf managed to get inside. Short of that, we'd be safer staying in here than trying to run faster than an angry skinwalker. Once I said that word, there was silence. I mean, there was silence in the cabin. The werewolf kept circling us and howling and making a minor riot out there. It felt like we were living inside that lost movie, The Werewolf. It felt like the movie wasn't actually lost. It was more alive now than ever. Now it was being reenacted in our reality as a real-life series of events. Only this was the hip and cool updated version, which was likely to be rated a hard R and have much gorier outcomes for me and each of my best buddies all gathered around in that moment of tension and fear. Look, said Manny, if this really is like that movie, the lost silent film, I mean, then she wants us off her land. Maybe we should just go. Even though we had no argument with his basic premise, none of the rest of us wanted to risk going out there. There was a heated discussion, and finally Manny said he was going to try to run to the car and then drive it right up to the door of the cabin. If he made it that far, then it should be safe for us to run out. If he didn't, then we could have his share of the microwavable junk food. I didn't like that idea at all, but I was outnumbered in the voting. We all got dressed and ready to go, and I turned things off and unplugged what might start a fire while I was gone. We all got packed and ready, and Manny stood by the front door, building up his nerve. Has anyone heard the old girl for a while? He asked us quietly, and we all shrugged. It did seem to be quiet out there. Maybe she had left. Manny said, now or never to himself, then opened the door. Immediately, in his face was the most savage, snarling, angry dog in attack mode that I have ever seen. She stood six feet tall on her hind legs and to me resembled an all-black husky type dog or something like that. But her belly was pink and her teeth were white. Her eyes looked insane as though they were in a state of complete rage. We saw all this for maybe a second before Manny tried to slam that door back shut again. The problem was, the she-wolf was on the other side, 
pushing to keep it open. Manny requested some help in between a lot of foul language, and we all threw our bodies at that door until we finally managed to close it. The she-wolf threw her body against the door, and we could see it move when she did so. I wasn't sure it would hold if she kept that up. Maybe another five or ten times, and she might open it. What happens if she figures out that glass is easier to break than a thick wooden door, asked one of us. I forget who. It didn't matter, though, because we were all thinking the exact same thing. However, she didn't. She would run around the house, slamming into the walls, and she would throw herself at the front door. She kept us terrified all night, too afraid to move, huddling close to each other in the corner furthest from the windows and the door. The noises stopped around dawn, but none of us dared to go look out the windows until almost 9 a.m. We packed and left in a somewhat normal fashion. This time we drove to the Waffle House in Hattiesburg, about a half hour away. We all needed some breakfast food to try to feel normal again, but the conversation was far more subdued than it had been back in Brooklyn. Things had really changed. I can't explain it other than that. I mean, nobody got hurt, and we didn't even lose one tape in the proceedings. But we left a lot of our childhood in that cabin. I guess childhood can sometimes be like watching movies, and adulthood can be more like living those movies out. And I guess we learned that it's sometimes kind of scary to be the hero of your own story. However, it sure beats the alternative. And that is my story of the Halloween movie binge, She-Wolf, Dad's House Dogman. When I was a kid and my parents moved to different places, I went with my mom. After my dad got situated though, the two of them arranged for me to stay with him for two weeks before school started again in the fall. It would be the first time I would ever see a cryptid in my life as I witnessed something I would come to call the Dad's House Dogman. Dad and I were never as close as me and my mother. I was not looking forward to staying with him. I didn't really have anything against him. It's just that I couldn't remember ever being alone with him before. It was always me and him and Mom, and a lot of the time other people in addition to the three of us. He didn't play catch with me, or take me to ball games, or any of that. He just worked his job and told me to shut up the rest of the time. That's what most fathers did back in those days, as far as what I've heard back from my friends. So, when I got to his place, and he had a big new color television set, I was quite relieved. My mother and I only had a small black and white one. He also got me a new bike, some blue jeans which my mother didn't allow me to wear in public, and best of all, he got us both a baseball glove each and a baseball too. He said that we were going to play catch every day. He said a lot of things though, and so I soon figured out games I could play with the ball and glove by myself. I could toss the ball as high in the air as possible, then try to catch it in a spectacular way like I was Willie Mays. I could practice pitching by trying to hit the knot in the tree which was my strike zone. After a while, Dad and I developed new routines so that we could avoid each other almost as much as in the old days. And on my last day, we came full circle when he officially told me to shut up. Hey, don't judge me. We all get comfort from what is familiar to us. But let's back up a while from me going home. Right in the middle of my trip out there to my dad's home, Something happened that changed my life. No, not that. I saw the dog man. Here's how it went down. I was pitching at the strike zone tree, and I threw one right off the corner that ricocheted out into the woods a bit. I call them the woods because that's what it looked like the entrance to. I have no idea how deep it actually went since I hadn't even ever been that far into it before. I remember 
Once under the tree canopy where it was darker and cooler, I could look forward and not be able to make out the end of the trees. But they were growing pretty close together, so that might only mean we were eight or nine rows deep. On the other hand, maybe it really did lead to a larger woods. I have no idea. I looked around for my ball, and I couldn't find it. This was the first time that it hadn't been in the first row of trees. I guess my fastball must not have had much on it in those days. I walked deeper and deeper into the trees, but I didn't see my ball. I felt this really strange feeling, like electricity, but not in a good way. It made my skin feel crackly, like my insides were burning. I didn't want to be there anymore, but I didn't know why. I had a deep feeling of regret as I turned around to walk out of the woods because I wanted my ball back. Now I would have to find something else to do, and I was only in the third inning of my simulated game. Then, to my surprise, rolling from behind me to in front of me, was my baseball. I couldn't believe it. That made no sense. I bent down to pick it up, then looked behind me, smiling, expecting my father to be there. My father was not there. Who was there was a tall furry, only not as in a man in a dog costume kind of furry. This was, I guess, a dog in a dog costume? I mean, it wasn't a costume, but it also wasn't a man. It was a dog man. It was looking down at me, and I was looking up at it. The entire world was frozen for a second, and I saw its tall pointed ears from an angle in which they resembled devil's horns. Its eyes shone bright like something demonic and I thought that I was about to be dragged down below the earth as some kind of punishment. I screamed like a little girl and ran out of the forest to my father. When I found him, ignoring me in the den and reading a newspaper, I grabbed him and I hugged him. He pushed me off him and told me he was almost done with his article. I sat down to wait for him to finish reading. Then, I remembered the dogman. Had he followed me? I stood up again to go look outside, but my father said he was finished reading his article, and now what did I want to tell him? I wasn't sure I wanted to tell him what happened any longer, because if that dogman really was a demon, and he really was there to take me down to the hot place then I probably must have done something wrong that I had forgotten about. And if that was the case, did I really want to tell my father about it? He might hand me over to the authorities for all I knew. He was unpredictable. On the other hand, if it was a monster, then he would probably think I was crazy and make me see a head shrink or maybe get shots in my stomach. I told him I thought I saw a bear in the woods. He told me... I should steer clear of those woods because he didn't want to hear my mother complaining about me getting eaten or whatever. Then he went back to reading his newspaper and I asked if I could watch TV. I didn't want to go back outside. It didn't seem safe. I spent as little time outside from then on as I was allowed to and would sometimes play out in front instead of in the back just to keep more space between me and the dogman. That doesn't mean I stopped seeing him, though. The bedroom I was sleeping in was up on the second floor, and it overlooked the woods a bit. It wasn't that high off the ground, and so I could only see about seven or eight rows deep from my angle. I could see the trees moving better from there as something moved through them than I could from ground level. It seemed that thing walked around every night, and some of the days, unless there were men or other man-sized bipedal creatures out there. At night, I would see him standing between two trees and staring at the house. I would look out the window from between the blinds, and he never looked my way. 
so I don't know if he ever noticed me looking back at him. He stared at the back of the house for some reason. Why did he do that? What do dogmen stare at? Maybe there was a cat there or something. All I know is, whenever I had to stay at my father's house, the dogman was always there too. When dad moved to New York City, I felt a deep sense of relief. Now, looking back on it, I kind of miss being able to look out my bedroom window and see an actual dogman standing right there. It's hard to believe it ever happened. Sometimes I wonder, if I had a chance, would I go back in time to see... The Dad's House. Dogman. The Railroad. Dogman. Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a story from my youth about the one time I saw something strange. I never saw a UFO. I never saw Bigfoot. I never saw Nessie. But one time, when I was in my early 20s, I am 100% certain I saw Dogman. And the reason I'm so certain is that he tried to get me. Like I said, this was many years ago. I was waiting for a train to come at the Wichita station. At least I remember it being Wichita. I know you New Yorkers probably think Wichita, Kansas is in the middle of nowhere, but it's a city. It's not a forest. In fact, it's the largest city in Kansas. Granted, it was a little less crowded back then, and this happened when I was alone on a lonely dark night. So, I was minding my own business on the train platform, and then, out of nowhere, I seen this guy running toward me, glaring at me. The first thing I noticed was the hatred in his stare, and the second thing I noticed was the strange way his eyes seemed to glow. Then, the third thing I noticed was... That was not a man. There was this large dog-looking ape man or bear man, and he was running toward me like he was competing in the Olympics. You see, he ran out of the forest and was then running over the train tracks. He was heading right toward the platform I was standing on and looking directly in my eyes. The entire effect was that this guy was someone from my past with a grudge or a debt to settle. He looked like I owed him money or something, and the closer he got, the more I could see that he was very, very large. I don't just mean tall, I mean large. This was like Chewbacca with a dog head, like a wolf head maybe. Very prehistoric or caveman looking. It reminded me of Bigfoot and Wild Boy from the TV, but with a dog head. Long hair like an Irish setter sometimes has, but not that orangey colored, more of a darker brown. The head was like a dog, but the manner of it was... Well, I want to say like a man, but really I guess it acted more like a monster. It looked scary, and it seemed like that was on purpose. It looked like it could beat up an 18-wheeler. When I got done being amazed by the thing, I realized it was going to crush me. I ran down that platform with no plan at all in my head about how I was going to survive this. I got to the end of the platform, looked behind, and saw that the big dog was still running toward me. Now you do understand that it was running like a decathlete, right? Not like a dog, but like a human being, only faster. It was gonna catch up with me before it went another ten steps, and I began to see every event that had happened in my entire life pass in front of my eyes. Then, I saw something truly amazing. 
someone came out of the interior station doors onto the platform without seeing that big dog in front of them. They were preoccupied reading their ticket or something and nearly walked into the dog, who was very curious about this other person. Realizing this dog being distracted was a gift from heaven, I turned and ran off that platform and down onto the level of the train tracks. I thought about trying to run away, but I needed to try and catch my train if possible. I also wasn't in good enough shape to outrun a tall werewolf thing. I found a place with big boards piled up and hid between two of them. I would be hidden from view for a while at least. There was screaming coming from the platform, and I prayed it was just someone being scared, not something worse. It was quiet for a while. Then, I could feel a train approaching. Peeking out from behind the wood piles, I saw it was my train, or at least it was on the right track. I was ready to take anything at that point. I looked toward the platform, and it seemed like the coast was clear. Not a single figure, large or small, in that direction. I got out and ran to the platform, wanting to get there before the train did. As I got to the stairs at the platform edge, I saw the last thing I wanted to see. The doors from inside burst open, and out came that big old dog man. I ducked back down behind the edge of the platform. If I timed this right, I would get away. If I didn't, well... So, the train pulled in and opened its doors. I charged up onto the platform, looking to see where the dog man was. As I did so, he saw me too, and our eyes met. I jumped into the car, sat down, and cheered. I had made it. I felt so relieved. Then, we sat there, and the doors didn't close. Then, I got nervous. What if the dogman was walking down this way? What if he had already boarded the train and was walking down this way from the inside? What if he had caused some delay, and now we would get stuck here? I wanted to get up and look outside, but I was afraid to. What if the dogman was right there? I felt like I was losing all my body heat, and I began to shiver. Shock shot through me as I saw him. He was there. The dogman was walking down the platform. Looking in the cars, he had to be looking for me. The speakers buzzed, and a voice said to watch for the closing doors. The dogman saw me just as this announcement was made. His eyes turned angry, and he lunged for the middle door of the car, missing holding them open by an inch. The doors closed. And once again, I cheered. We sat there, the dogman and me, looking at each other through the plexiglass door windows. Was this train going to move? Or were those doors going to open again? He and I both had a lot riding on this, so we both just stayed frozen in position, looking at each other. And then... The train lurched forward and we were off. That dogman didn't get it that the story was over. He started running along the train tracks, barking and snarling. After a while, he dropped to all fours, and after that, he faded back. I never saw anything like that before, and never again since. I have absolutely no explanation for... The Railroad. Dogman. Got another Dogman story, so don't go anywhere. The Cemetery. Dogman. D. 
Dear Scary Stories NYC, I have a particularly strange dogman story to tell you. It's very personal and would be extremely embarrassing for me to reveal to almost anyone I know, but I need to get it out of my system. I'm going to tell it to you, and whether you use the story or not, I'm going to try to forget about it once it's told. This is not only a scary story. It's a description of a period of my life that I would like to leave in the past. I got married when I was in my early 20s to a woman that I absolutely adored. I doted on her. I achieved more at work and made more money so that I could take care of her and keep her contented. She had always been sickly and her doctor bills grew year by year right along with my love for this woman. We were beginning to plan our 20th wedding anniversary party when she was taken from us suddenly by the resurgence of a health issue we had thought we had defeated. I don't have to explain how painful this was. I had hoped we would have had many more years together. I lost my entire world on that day. At the funeral, in the morning of the following Sunday... It was raining and miserable out. The preacher said something about angels crying, but it was just a miserable day. I looked off in the distance, and I thought very negative and self-pitying thoughts. I was staring into a patch of trees, when suddenly my gaze was met by what appeared to be two glowing eyes staring right back into mine. This stirred me out of my reverie, and I looked around to see that the sermon was still being read. Nobody was looking at me, so hopefully I hadn't done anything stupid while I was zoned out. I looked back to where I thought I had seen those eyes, but now there were only trees there. Had I really seen that? Who would be in the woods in the rain? After the ceremony... Everyone left except for me and the guy who worked there at the cemetery. He told me he had lost his wife earlier than expected too, so he was patient with me, even in all that rain. He offered me a drink from his special container, and it did warm me up a bit inside. We both stood there, under our umbrellas, staring down at the coffin, getting rained on. On a whim, I asked him, Hey, what would make yellow eyes shine from that little patch of forest over there? Yellow eyes shine, he asked. Yeah, yellow eyes shine around probably six or seven feet off the ground, I added. Owl, he informed me, sounding sure of himself. Owls got yellow eyes shine, and in the rain, they might take cover in those trees. That made sense to me. I felt sad that the mystery of that part was over. It had distracted me from the fact that I was about to drive home to an empty apartment. My friends tried to get me to socialize and meet new women, but I was going to need an extended grieving period just to accept what had happened. I had grown more attached to my wife each year of our marriage. She had come up with a plan early on to keep our marriage fresh. We would take separate vacations. It would make the time we spent together more precious, and it would also give us space to blow off steam and not get bored with each other. I used to enjoy our time apart because I knew how good it was going to feel to get back together. This time was different, and it was final. I soon started going through her stuff because... I wasn't going to leave it where it was. I felt that either the place would become a museum and a shrine to her, or I would go through her stuff, organize it, decide how to distribute or toss out what there was, and move forward with my life. I wasn't in a rush to get it done. I wanted to look at each and every thing, understand what it was, and the part it had played in her life then use all of that 
to both mourn her passing and accept it at the same time. It was self-indulgent, but it was a process that made sense to me, and it had a beginning, middle, and end. Once it was over, it would be over, and that would be that. I had permission to feel as sad as I wanted while doing this. Then, once I got it out of my system, I had permission to release it and not have to feel bad about it ever again. I was surprised how few actual things she had. Lots of clothes, lots of utilitarian things, and a little bit of jewelry, some makeup. Very few things that she kept for sentimental reasons. No snail mail correspondences except for bills, and even that she seemed to move over to paying online with more recently. I looked, finally, at her computer. What should I do with that? Destroy it? Have the hard drive wiped? There might be photos or videos on there that I might want to keep. Maybe it would be less painful to never know. Maybe it was an invasion of privacy if I looked in it, but... If she was gone, and I was her husband, it technically was my computer at that point. She had one of those Macs that are like a big screen and that's it. I mean, there was a keyboard and a mouse with no right click, and the computer was somehow inside the screen itself. I'm a PC man myself, and I always found the thing confusing and hard to work with. I decided to sleep on it, and that night... I dreamed I was at the cemetery again in the rain. I looked to see if I could find those owl eyes in that patch of forest. It was hard to see through the rain. It was coming down so hard and thick. I thought I saw something moving in there and was surprised to see. It was my wife. I told the preacher to stop, that we needed to stop the ceremony. I said my wife was alive. She was in that forest. I pointed her out, and someone else said they saw her as well. But, as we all watched, from out of the darkness behind her, emerged those two yellow eyes again. They moved forward into the light and revealed that they did not belong to an owl. No, they belonged to a demonic-looking wolf-like man. That's the best I can describe him. It was like a werewolf from a horror movie. I remember a woman screaming. And I woke up. My bed was drenched in sweat. It was like I had a fever. I went to the bathroom and looked in the mirror. And I was not looking well. I decided I would look through that computer the next day. At least in a cursory way. And make my decision about how to handle it. Then, I would essentially be done with my past and ready to come back to the world of the present and the living. I hoped if I did that, I would never see that demonic wolf thing in my dreams ever again. So, the Big Mac took me a while to learn my way around, but she didn't have anything password protected, and eventually I think I figured out what program she had and where her files were stored. She had a few art and video programs, and I wondered if one of our younger relatives might find them useful, maybe for one of their kids or something, I don't know. It would be stupid to throw out a perfectly good computer. If nobody wanted it, then I guessed I could Google how to wipe her stuff off the hard drive and sell it on eBay. But first I wanted to look a little closer and see if I could find anything that might be worth downloading to a flash drive and keeping, like photos or whatever. I got to a folder called Correspondences that lit my eyes up because, as I said, I hadn't been able to find any hand or typewritten correspondence of hers at all. Opening the folder, I was surprised to discover another folder inside that folder with the name Bill. I thought about it. I didn't know any Bills or any Williams. That seemed odd since it was a common name. Then I realized she must have meant bills. This was probably just the folder she kept her bills in. I double-clicked on it, and inside that folder, I found two more folders. 
One was labeled Picks, and the other labeled Letters. I opened Letters first, an action which would utterly change my entire life. Inside that folder, there were stored emails and saved chats between my beloved wife and some man named Bill that I had never heard of and didn't know existed. They went back to the year 2002. In the earlier entries, I was regularly referred to by both sides as Idiot Boy. In the more recent conversations, I had grown into That Old Idiot. My weight was mocked. My increasing baldness was made fun of. My wife had told me she thought both were cute. But she told this guy that they made her stop caring about me in the same way. The photos folder was even harder to go through. There she was at all the places she had sent me photos from on her solo vacations. Except, in these photos, she was looking very comfortable with this macho-looking guy. He looked like the poor man's Burt Reynolds kind of cowboy hat and that same kind of stupid mustache. In fact, she looked far more comfortable with him than she had ever looked in photos with me. There was a saved chat where an old Bill was asking my wife to divorce me and to go with him. She told him she couldn't because his health insurance didn't cover as much as mine did. She was only with me for my health insurance. It's odd the things that can completely change your world. Reading that old chat actually altered my personal reality more than even the passing of my wife had. That one chat, or my awareness of it, not only changed my present, but it changed all of my past as well. It cheapened it. I no longer was a man who had sacrificed everything to make the woman he loved comfortable in her final years. I was the stupid moron who she and her boyfriend charged their vacations and their health care to. The guy who, in fact, had been living his life for someone who never loved him in the first place and never even saw him as important to her. I thought about how different my old age would have been if I had just tossed that old Mac out and never looked inside it. Carrying the thing downstairs, my first intention was to throw it in the garbage. Then I got a better idea. It was already dark out, but I drove to the cemetery anyway. I was in quite an agitated state. I was not my normal self. When I got to the gate, of course it was closed. I beeped the horn until someone came out with a flashlight. It was my friend, the one who had lost his wife, the one who was kind to me on the day of the funeral. He greeted me warmly but seemed surprised to see me. I explained I needed to get inside. He told me he couldn't let me in and I knew he couldn't. I slipped him some bills and looked him in the eyes pleadingly. I said it would only be just this one time and I had to do one final thing. I had to do it that night. He looked conflicted but opened the gate and I drove inside. He asked if I wanted him to come with me, but I asked him to please allow me some privacy. He said he understood, and we parted ways. I laid that old Mac computer on my wife's grave. I told her she might need it to communicate to the man she loved. Then, I kicked that screen in, making sure nobody ever used that piece of machinery ever again. It didn't make me feel any better and I cried. I couldn't help it. The tears ran down off my face as hard as the rain had fallen on the day of her funeral. I looked up through my watery vision, and my heart almost stopped. It was the yellow eye shine in that little forest. I froze in horror. This was my dream coming true, but then I laughed at myself. What had my friend working the gate told me that day? It was an owl. I chuckled at myself being afraid of an owl. 
Then, that owl moved forward into the moonlight, and I could see it was no owl. It was no bird at all. Those yellow eyes were not perched on a branch. They were inside a large, hairy dog head, and they were staring right at me. I was asleep. I was dreaming again. None of this had happened. I would wake up and find there were no love letters on the Mac. Maybe I would wake up and find my wife would still be alive. How much of this had happened? How much was in the dream? A cold wind gusted from my right and sent a cold shiver through me. I watched as the same breeze blew the long brown fur of that angry-looking demon dogman. I had to admit, it sure felt like this was all really happening. I studied the thing as it walked toward me. Then it began to speed up into a run. It seemed like an actual man and an actual dog mixed together. The teeth were too large. The eyes, they shouldn't glow like that. It was so strange. Instead of running from it, I wondered if I were imagining it. A loud retort woke me, and I heard my friend from the gate shouting at me. What was he saying? He was telling me to watch out, to get away from that thing. He seemed to be sharing my hallucination. In a daze, I got in my car and started driving slowly around toward the exit. As I did so, I blandly took in that the dogman was now chasing my friend instead of me. I was in shock, and I really don't remember driving home. It's incredible how the body can sometimes go on autopilot. I don't really have any more to say about this story, except to say that sometimes the demons of your past are so real, they can chase you through the cemetery. Sometimes... The skeletons in your closet grow fur and fangs and come back to haunt you. Sometimes you finally begin to learn how to live life in the here and now. Only after you get chased out of your own past. Bye. The Cemetery Dogman. We're going to have a special longer episode on the 30th. Our Night Before Halloween special. But... We have something special for today as well, in the form of this scary werewolf story called The Halloween Werewolf Costume That Wasn't Dear Scary Stories NYC When I was a kid, toward the end of childhood when I was starting to get too old for trick-or-treating, I got assigned to a group of trick-or-treaters being monitored and supervised by a small group of teenagers. I didn't like the arrangement and thought that at least two of the teenagers in question were jerks. But my parents and older sister were all busy and it was this or no trick-or-treating at all. We got into costumes, including the teens, and it got confusing pretty quickly. Our so-called supervisors seemed more interested in getting their own share of the candy than in keeping everyone safe and I figured out pretty quickly I'd better stay alert and look out for myself if I was going to get out of this all right. And that might be why I was the only one who noticed the werewolf costume that wasn't. After we had walked a couple of blocks, we were joined by a figure about 5 foot 10, dressed as the most realistic looking werewolf I had ever seen. Its eyes actually glowed, but not as bright as you show them in your thumbnails. Of course, it was only starting to get dark then. I could see his irises and pupils, but his eyes were glowing lightly. The eyes looked wet. They seemed real. I felt nervous looking at him for too long. In my ghost outfit, with the stupid sheet over my head, I could hardly look at anybody except by looking at them directly. 
I tried to remember who was wearing what costume. I remember I had one friend named Richie in this group of kids, but I couldn't remember if he was the one in the Bill Clinton mask or the one in the Freddy Krueger mask. I went over and looked in the face of Bill Clinton, who got frightened by me staring at her. I didn't realize that was a girl as Bill Clinton, and I apologized. Freddy Krueger was my man, and I sidled up to him, identifying myself. I already know who you are, dork, said Richie. Ah, the sweet memories of youth. I pointed out the werewolf and asked Richie if he remembered that guy being with us when we started. How am I supposed to remember, he asked me. Am I the, like, attendance monitor? I asked him to tell me which of the older kids that was in the costume. We went down the list, and all of the older kids were walking in front of our group. That werewolf was walking behind our group. Richie started to get nervous, the same as I was. He didn't think it was an actual werewolf, but he did think it was bad news. I, on the other hand, thought it was both bad news and a real dog man. So I view myself as being ahead of the curve, which was a rare thing for me in those days. Richie jogged ahead and spoke with one of the older kids running the show, and soon all four had taken notice of the werewolf in werewolf's clothing, trailing closely behind us. The four teenagers stopped, looking back toward the dogman costume. The younger kids walked past the teens, but the werewolf held back a little. Hey, you said the teen with the Tor Johnson mask on. Who are you? We all waited, and the person or creature just stood there. Take off your mask, called out one of the other teens, as he took his own mask off. See, this is who I am. Everyone take your masks off. We all did, except me, since I had a sheet over my head cinched around my waist, and once it came off... It wasn't going back on again. This is who we all are, said the teenage boy. Now show us who you are. The werewolf had been pacing back and forth, left foot to right foot, impatiently, and growing increasingly agitated as the teenager had been lecturing him. The whole time, it made that sound of dog nails on the pavement. His feet were too small to be the feet of a costume for a human to be inside. Those were actual animal legs. This was some kind of bipedal living being that seemed to be a kind of a dog. I looked at its front paws, which looked enlarged and possibly deformed. I thought, maybe the poor thing is injured and can't walk on its front paws, so it learned how to walk on its hind legs. The problem with my theory was that, if those paws were deformed, or malformed, or injured, they were both hurt or changed in identical ways. They were mirror images of each other, as most hands or paws are. They seemed more as though the animal had claw-like hands than malformed paws. It reminded me of Lassie, the way its face and chest hair fell. But there was no light-colored fur on this beast. It was dark, almost black in color, and the darker it got out, the brighter its eyes seemed to glow. I was glad the animal was focused on the teenagers because those eyes were hypnotic, and I felt that the creature must possess some kind of natural mesmeric power. So the werewolf had just stood there looking at the boys as they shouted at him and asked him questions. Now that he hadn't answered even one of them, the boys were telling him to stay back and go hang with some other group. He either had to show who he was and introduce himself, or he had to leave immediately. Again, no response, the dog man just looked at them. One of them said something to the other three quietly. Then the three of them began calling for us to all keep going. 
We resumed walking, but I walked backwards so I could see what was going to happen next. The head teenager was walking back toward the upright walking canid, who seemed quite alarmed that he was being approached. With a wild look in his eyes, that dogman reared back and howled straight up into the air, then came down, teeth bared, growling and snarling in such a manner that the teenage boy backed up and kept backing up. Howls were returned from off in the east, then the southwest, then the northwest, then both south and north simultaneously. We were surrounded by these things, and we never had any idea before that moment. How did he make that happen? asked one of the teenagers, still thinking this was a guy in a costume. He's not a trick-or-treater, I said, pointing at the feet. Nobody could fit their feet into its wolf feet, and that's because it's real. With a look of utter horror in their eyes, the teenagers all screamed, Run! And we all ran. We went up to the door of a house that was on the street level, ringing the bell and banging on the door. The dogman was trotting up behind us, snarling and looking annoyed when the man inside eventually opened the door in his stained undershirt and boxers. We all ran in that door before he could even say hello. He cursed at us and told us to get out, but then he saw that werewolf or a dogman or whatever it was, and he slammed his door and locked it. One of you kids call the police, he shouted, and we began looking around for his telephone. This was before cell phones, you see. There was a loud sound at the front door. The dogman was ramming into it, trying to break in. He was hitting it hard enough that you could see the door buckle in a little bit each time it hit. I wondered if we should be running out the back when I heard the dogman trying to get in from that door as well. We were all screaming and running in circles, not sure where the safest place was. I heard someone on the phone with the cops, and as I heard both the front and back door being hit at the same time, I realized there was more than one of those things out there, and they were trying to get in all over. I went to the kid talking on the phone and shouted to tell the police to hurry. Soon, I was joined by a couple other kids and the homeowner, all shouting the same thing. There was a crash of glass in the back of the house, followed by a lot of panicked shouting. I saw the flashing lights outside before I even heard the sirens. I think I had lost all sense of hearing for a few moments as I saw what could only have been the hairy, clawed hand of a dogman or werewolf pushing itself through one of the windows on the back door. This was not an animal paw, and yet, at the same time, this was not a human hand. It was not a hand in the sense of a monkey or ape paw either. If I had to compare it to anything, I would have to say it was like a giant raccoon paw. It was like a hand if a hand had been weaponized with long, sharp, deadly-looking claws. Time had slowed to almost a standstill as I watched that hand or paw or claw push itself in, then withdraw itself outside again. There was a lot of tumult and police searching both the interior and exterior of the grounds. There was some questioning the owner of the home if he always entertained guests in his current wardrobe. He grabbed a bathrobe and put it on, much to the relief of all of the rest of us, I'm sure. 
The cops didn't catch any dogmen, and our parents came one by one and two by two to pick us all up. Mine came last and lectured me at what an inconvenience it had just been to have to come all the way over to pick me up. I tried to tell the story of the werewolf chasing us into the house to my mom, but I was told to shut up and save my whining for my father. Then she put on her cassette she had made with the ABBA song Fernando on permanent loop and began to sing along, ignoring me the rest of the way home. So, in other words, I had a traumatic and terrifying experience with the dog man, but I never got any acknowledgement as someone who had suffered in this way. To be honest, the dead life of my family was more of a constant negativity, and to me, that hurt worse than having a scary experience. Rather than making me hide from life like a wilting flower, the complete lack of care whether I lived or died, was happy or in a trauma, that emanated from both my parents was so repellent that I found myself craving fear and danger. At least, if you survived a scary experience, you felt alive for a little while. Your heart would beat, your blood would flow, maybe you just risked your life to get there, but it sure beat the slow death of living with my family. When I got old enough, I moved out, and after I got far enough away from the rest of them, I made new friends. Eventually, I was able to locate other people who are seeking to learn what there is to learn in life by taking risks. We're talking about forming a paranormal research organization. We don't just want to investigate ghosts, and we don't want to pigeonhole what we find into pre-existing categories. We don't want to provide answers so much as we want to ask newer and better questions. Because of our desire to reinvent the wheel with this organization, we are moving slowly with it. I, for one, hope it becomes a reality and that we can one day figure out what exactly those dog-like men were that haunted us that Halloween. I ran into one of the other kids who were there that night on the internet recently. He still talked about it as though the dog men were people in costumes. I know he saw the first one as well as I did, and there's no way that was a human being. I said something to that effect, and found myself cut off and blocked from communicating with his account any longer. I suppose we all have our own ways of coping with trauma. I'm stunned that here we are, fully grown adults, and we're still debating the reality or falseness of... The Werewolf Costume That Wasn't The Werewolf Next Door Dear Scary Stories NYC When I was becoming a young man, our family's neighbors moved out and in moved a lovely middle-aged widow. She was soft-spoken and nice, and I had never met a woman like her before. I was the only boy in my family, and all my sisters were tomboys. Do they still use that term? All the girls at school were tougher than the boys too, and my mother knew how to fix a car, while my father knew how to cook dinner. So I had never met a soft-spoken and polite female before. I felt protective of our new neighbor, and made it a point to check up on her and see to it that she was adjusting well to moving into our part of the world. One night, I saw what I thought was a man prowling around the back of her property. I could see her backyard from my bedroom window, so I watched with increasing alarm. As the man came into the light and revealed himself to be no man at all, but a hairy animal of some kind. It really looked like a dog and a very shaggy one at that. I saw it somehow open the door to my neighbor's basement and walk down the steps inside. I ran downstairs in my house asking if anyone knew the phone number to the lady next door. I told them I had just seen either a large dog or maybe a bear get into her cellar from the backyard. My parents didn't have her number, but my father said he'd call the police 
while I ran next door to help the lady. I sped to her front door and started ringing that doorbell like it was a pinball machine. There was no answer, so after a while I peeked around into her driveway. There was her car parked there, so unless she was out for a walk, she must be home. Unless... The idea that she might have been down in that basement when the bear or whatever that was entered sent chills through me. I wasn't sure what to do. I thought about trying to get in the same way the animal did through that back basement entrance, but quickly thought better of it. I was going to have to wait for the police to show up. I couldn't just break and enter. I was about to return home to wait for the arrival of the law enforcement when... I was stunned to see the front door open. It was the lady. She was fine. Before I could say anything, she greeted me by name and apologized for taking so long to come open the door, saying she had just been in the back, working in her basement. In her what? The police arrived and I explained to both them and the lady what I had seen. I thought it was a dog but it seemed bipedal, so maybe it was a shaggy type of bear. The one cop glared at me. A shaggy type of bear, he asked me. Yeah, bear with long curly hair, I answered with all the earnestness of a teenager. Bears don't have curly hair, dear. My neighbor broke it to me. The cops found no animal in the cellar or on the property but they did see dog prints in the mud by that back cellar entrance. It was decided I had seen a stray dog going into the cellar, but that it had left. My father was given a warning not to call the police again unless there was a real danger. He was told that one more crank call and he'd be on the crank list for life. Then no more phone calls from our phone number would ever be answered by the cops again. That sent a chill through me, and I knew I would get blamed for this happening. And I was grounded for two weeks, locked in my room to do homework and of course to watch out my window as that large dogman thing went into and out of my neighbor's house via her back basement door. I didn't tell anyone what I had seen, but I continued to watch. I really wanted to know what that curly-haired dogman bear thing was. I wished with all my heart to get to find out what it really actually truly was that I was seeing. That thing used her place like it lived there. She had to be aware of it. She had to know about this. It was her choice to leave that back door unlocked even after the police told her to lock it that day. She wouldn't have made a choice like that unless she had a very good reason. That had to be a dogman or werewolf, and my neighbor had to be in league with him. She had to be aiding and abetting an actual real-life dog-headed monster. Now, there was a movie back then called Fright Night. Not the remake, which came later, but the original with Roddy McDowell. It was about a vampire that moves next to a guy's family home. This really reminded me of that, except I never saw the werewolf in his human form. I saw the lady, and I saw the monster. I couldn't figure out where she was keeping the monster, since the police didn't find it any place inside her house. It must have run back out before they got there, but where did it stay when it was there? They didn't mention seeing a big cage or a chain, or even a big water bowl in the basement, so... Where did she keep the dog man when it was in her home? One night, I woke around 1 a.m. just randomly, hearing a strange sound outside my window. I looked out and saw it was the dog man, and he was leaving my neighbor's house through the back entrance to the basement. He ran off into the nearby woods on his hind legs, just the most incredible thing you can imagine seeing. It left the door to the basement wide open, lying there, leaning against the house, calling to me, begging me to enter inside. I put on my slippers and bathrobe and walked out in the hallway, pretending that I needed to use the bathroom. 
Really, I was checking to see if my parents were awake or asleep. Their room was dark, and it sounded like they were snoring, so I snuck back into my room and put on my sneakers instead of my slippers. Soon, I found myself out in the cold night, standing in my neighbor's backyard uninvited, staring down into the stairwell leading down to her basement, shining my flashlight around in there. I was trying to get up the nerve to go down and look, but I was old enough to know this was not something legal to do, and that I would likely get more than two weeks of grounding if I got caught down there. Well, I would have to go in, search around, and get out fast because that dogman would be coming back, and I didn't want to be inside when he did. I have no explanation for where my foolhardy courage came from. Maybe it was just my insatiable curiosity that drove me, but I took one step down that staircase, then the next, and soon I was standing on that basement floor, searching all around. And it was a basement. That was it, just, just a basement. It didn't have any werewolf cages and didn't seem to have any secret rooms. It definitely did not have a giant chain embedded into a concrete floor strong enough to hold a dogman prisoner. Nothing in that place looked out of the ordinary. I noticed there were stairs on the opposite side of the cellar that went up to a room within the house. The door at the top of the steps was open, so maybe the dogman was kept up there. Maybe he came downstairs only to use the back exit and not be seen by the neighbors, other than me, of course. I had come this far, so I quietly went up the stairs and found myself in my neighbor's kitchen. Everything was quiet. Her kitchen clock ticked away. The refrigerator hummed. There was nothing about this house that wasn't completely, 100%, absolutely normal in every single way. I wandered through the house, shining my flashlight all about, but finding everything incredibly boring and predictable. I went upstairs. Maybe she keeps the dog man in a bedroom up there, I reasoned. Up the stairs I crept, and once I made it to the second floor, I heard nothing. Just more silence. I walked down the hall, creaking doors open one by one. A guest bedroom. A ladies' room. A sewing room. A bedroom. Was my neighbor sleeping? I listened, but could hear no sound coming from within. I remembered that this lady was refined and understated. She would not be as likely to snore piggishly the way my entire family did when they slept. I stuck my head ever so slowly into the doorway, checking to see that there was nobody in the lady's bed. It was messed up as though someone had been sleeping there, but nobody was in that bed when I was looking. Had she been chased out by the dogman? Was she in danger? Might she be hiding somewhere? I called her name softly and listened, but there was no answer. I tiptoed to the closed door of the closet in her room and softly called her name one more time. There was no answer, and so I knew I was going to have to pull that door open. I closed my eyes and prayed for the strength to get through this. I was going to pull that door open, and I might not like what I was going to see on the other side. One, two, three, pull. I screamed in fear, but nothing fell on top of me, and I managed to open my eyes and look in that closet. There, I saw clothing and shoes, some boxed stuff on an upper shelf, no hiding neighbor, no dogman victim. Just another boring, typical thing you'd expect to find in someone's house. I was confused. I admit it. 
but I was also defeated. I had found nothing, and I had better get out of that house before. Slam. Out back. The sound had come from out back. I ran to a window overlooking the backyard and saw it. The door to the basement had been slammed shut. That meant only one thing. The dog man had returned home. I had to get out of there. I never was so panicked in my life before. I felt like I had gone from being worried about punishment by my parents to worrying about possibly getting arrested for my actions to now being worried about what I was going to be eaten up by for a late night snack. Tears streamed down my cheeks as I felt the hot blushing embarrassment of the realization that I had messed up this time worse than I'd ever messed up before. At the very least, I was in a lot of trouble. At the very worst, I was not going to see the sunrise. Turning my flashlight off, I ran down the stairs, intending on leaving through the front door. As I did so, I heard police sirens on the street outside and thought better of my original plan. Maybe I could get out the back door before that thing came upstairs into the kitchen. Running to the back of the house, I discovered it was already too late for that plan as well. There were loud steps of a heavy beast walking up from the basement. I slid into the pantry and closed the door. Inside the dark pantry, I could peek out through the slats in the door to see into the better lit kitchen. There, I saw the beast emerge from the cellar. It was not just a dog man. It was an excruciatingly ugly dog man. It was covered in mangy hair loss and acne and scratches and it shed everywhere as it walked. This was one sorry looking monster. I almost screamed. It was so horrifying to see it in front of me. If you saw this thing, you would, as I did, have instinctual fight or flight mechanisms fire off inside your nervous system. I wanted to run so badly. I wanted to scream so much. It was all I could do to hold still and stay motionless. I weeped in the darkness, knowing that if I made even one sniffling noise, that hideous beast would hear me and make short work of me. This was the worst situation I had ever gotten myself into, and it was all my own fault. Everything bad my teachers and parents had said about me was going through my head. Why was I so stupid? Why did I come here? Why did I need to see this monster so up close? Why was I so curious about something as horrible as this thing? You've got to be careful what you wish for. I heard my grandmother say it in my ear. She told me that when I was very young, after she told me the story of the monkey's paw. Don't wish, unless you're very careful about it. You might get exactly what you've wished for, but it might not be as nice as you thought it would be. I wished to understand what this monster was, and now I was going to find out. The beast was standing hunched over in the kitchen because it was too tall to stand up there. A banging came from the front door as the police were shouting to be let in. If only I could go to the door and let them in. But if I left that pantry... The dog man would see me long before I could get anywhere near the front door. The beast jerked sideways, and I almost fell over backwards. I thought it had seen or heard me in the pantry, and my heart almost seized up on me. Then, I thought it was reacting to the sound of the police at the front door. When it kept jerking, though, back and forth and up and down and sideways... I saw that it was not reacting to me, or the cops, or anything exterior to the creature at all. It was itself having some form of attack. It resembled epilepsy, I thought, as I had seen a film about that at school. 
I couldn't believe what I was seeing as the creature collapsed to the floor in a bubbling, smoking, terrible-smelling mess. I was weeping as I thought I was watching the creature melting. Nothing was making the slightest bit of sense to me when the mass on the floor began to congeal and rise up once again, forming a new shape this time. It hardened. Then the exterior began to crack and melt off, and when it was done, I saw the image of... Not the dogman, but my neighbor herself. It transformed back into my lady neighbor. That wasn't a dogman at all. It was a female werewolf. She grabbed a bathrobe that had been hanging over a chair and tossed it on as she casually called out to the police that she was coming. As soon as she was out of the kitchen, I ran out of the pantry and, shaking, made my way across her kitchen floor, barely able to make my legs move one in front of the other. It was all I could do to get the doorknob to turn in my hands, which barely were functioning. I was very concerned that I might faint, and I didn't want to do that until I was off my neighbor's property. My werewolf neighbor's property. As shocking as this all was, that was the hardest part for me to accept. She was not in danger from the beast. She was not keeping the beast as a pet. She was the beast herself. I walked across her backyard to ours and entered our driveway on the way to our back door. Up in front of the house, I saw my parents standing there, observing the police car with its flashing lights parked out on the street. I walked up behind them, pretending to be waking up, and asked what all the noise and excitement was about. My father told me that my mother had seen someone walking around on the second floor of our neighbor's house with a flashlight. I casually pushed my flashlight into my bathrobe pocket and acted surprised. That lady moved out in only a few months. I hope for her sake and her new neighbors that she chose a more secluded location to afford herself more privacy. Although I felt a huge sense of relief watching the movers pack her stuff up and take it away, I also felt a sense of regret. Imagine if I had managed to figure out how to make friends with that woman. Imagine if I had gained her trust and gotten to hear all the incredible stories that only she would be able to tell. Imagine what it might have been like to have become the confidant of the werewolf next door. Hey, it's me, Henry Lee Dogman, here to thank those of you who support all of us here at Scary Stories NYC. It really helps us if you click like, and if you forward our videos or leave cool comments. If you can, it helps us even more when you let us share our 25-episode and growing collection of uncensored, scary Dogman stories with you by becoming a paid subscriber at PeterBernard.com. That's right. Join our monthly club and get 25 stories right off the bat, each of them wilder than what we're allowed to tell you on this channel. Then, each Sunday, get another new scary story, usually a dogman story, but always uncensored and secret, available nowhere else on the planet. Please consider joining us today at PeterBernard.com and keep the scary stories coming. Thanks, everyone. If you enjoyed this, please click like or consider subscribing. Remember to click the bell icon or you won't get notifications. If you want to listen to Bigfoot's secret uncensored story each Sunday, just go to PeterBernard.com and become a paid subscriber. See you tomorrow. Same dog time, same dog channel. Scary, scary, scary stories. stories.